what's going to kill my car is right here above the driver. There's an area about this long and this wide of chance. And I took the body to the shop, and the guy went, this is what you really do in there because you're involving the, the structure piece, whatever that's called. And he says, and this piece that goes back, you're on that frame part. And he says, then you get into the windshield. And says, well, all right. Well, let's see. I better. Well, I guess I can't talk to anybody. Sue has probably talked to everybody that I need to chat with. All right, take a five minutes. All right, all right. Good luck today. We swapped them, so.
word first. Come taste and see the goodness, the wonders of the risen man. So there's perfect for this kind of
Thank you, Peter Black, for that beautiful, beautiful prelude. Good morning and welcome. Happy Sunday to everyone here in the sanctuary um, and the Friendship Hall and those of you watching online this morning on the second Sunday of Easter. My name is Kathleen Mueller. I am a member here at Douglas UCC where we are an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ. That means no matter who you are, what you believe, who you love, how you express yourself, you are welcome as a member of the beloved community and at our communion table. We're so glad you could join us this morning. Today we will be led in our, by our church member, Mark Johnston, who is the council moderator, and by uh, now we all know him and love him, and thank you so much, Mark. First, a few announcements about our work in the community, and I will try to move as quickly as possible, but we are a very, very busy group of people. So, <clears throat> Beginning next Sunday, we're going to try out a change at the beginning of our service because we have not had enough change. So we're going to, we're going to ring the bell exactly at 10, and then we're gonna light the candles, and then we'll ha have announcements before quieting ourselves for the service. So a little bit of change of order there. Uh, we think this will make for a smoother transition from our busy worlds into the world of worship together. Kudos to our Art Guild. Uh, they, uh, the beautiful installations as we approached Easter and Easter Sunday were, were a gift and an inspiration. We so appreciate all of their hard work. Our, our, our Art Guild members are Jamina Petruzzelli, Bud Beatty, Jody Baralt, Floyd Fleming, Greg Harvath, and Chris Maidner, and thank you to, you, to all of you. This, this is big news. news. Our new interim pastor, Reverend Jody Batten, has begun her tenure with us. I don't see her, but we will. She's working part-time as she winds down her work at Fountain Street in Grand Rapids and gears up here. There is a great uh, time to introduce Reverend Jody and an important piece she wrote uh, about the intentional interim process in the epistle. She will not be a placeholder pastor. She has vision and plans for us. She will have us focusing hard on who we are and what we want to be as we steer this church into new waters. And speaking of Jody Betton, we are going to be having um, a feast for the soul welcome luncheon for her. Her first preaching Sunday will be April 21st, followed by a welcome luncheon in the Friendship Hall. And that is also the first meal in a new offering that will be called a feast for the soul, a series of six church family dinners of soup and bread that will be held in our friendship hall. So that we can more accurately judge the quantity of both food and drink, we, we kindly ask that you sign up for the dinners on the sign-up sheet in the friendship hall. A Feast for the Soul is co-sponsored by the Retreat House Spiritual Ministry Team and the Pastoral Relations Committee. Tuesdays are for caregivers. Uh, Caregiver Tuesdays have been extended through May. That is from 10.30 to noon. Reverend Marty is frequently the host um, of this respite time for caregivers, and it is at our retreat house and spiritual center across the street. Our social justice team presents a book read and a book discussion. The book is, And They Were Wonderful Teachers, How the History of LGBTQ Plus Teachers Informs Its Current School Battles. It is by Karen L. Graves, Professor Emerita from the Lucier's own Denison University. Her book was awarded a 2010 Critics Book Award from the American Educational Studies Association. Part one of this book, a discussion will be held here on April 11th at 7 p.m. Part two will be held at the Saugatuck Douglas District Library on the 31st, May 31st at 4.30. And there she will present the fight isn't over. 
And it's not too late to try living the questions. Uh, this is the book read that uh, Jeremy and uh, Reverend Nierman have been uh, hosting. But they're somewhat through the book, but they're about to start part three. And that is where it gets really interesting. So you're welcome, even if you've not been joining them before, to join now. And, uh, they, and that uh, the topic of transformation includes social justice, incarnation, prayer, compassion, and creative transformation. So it seems like uh, a, a fair time to join in. So if you need to uh, check with Linda Nierman, please contact her by email. But wait, there's more. The Creation Justice team is working on campus landscaping. This multi-year project seeks to create easy to maintain spaces that remove carbon from the atmosphere, reduce our use of scarce resources, attract pollinators, and provide for contemplation and discussion. A core group has already met with Lake Effect Garden and Design, and the full team will do the same on April 22nd. We expect to present a final plan to the council in May and then share it with the congregation in June. So that's exciting news. Team Donovan is still walking for a cure. Each year, Team Donovan hits the road in their sneakers, raising money to fuel research for a cure and treatments for people with multiple sclerosis. Sarah Donovan and her team invite you to walk with her or support her team financially on their April 20th walk in Grand Rapids. It's easy to don donate if you check the epistle. Our grant proposal committee has, uh, together with the church council, granted funds to two worthy local organizations. One is Interfaith Action of Southwest Michigan, and the other is Wishbone Pet Rescue. There are more details for each of the announcements in the um, epistle because there's always so much that we are involved in around our community. So make sure you read that epistle. Are there any other announcements this morning? Oh my goodness! <laughs> wow, burn! This is really just a clarification. If you're interested in the program that Karen Graves is presenting to us, I want you to know you do not have to read the book and you do not have to be prepared to discuss the book. Oh! Because Karen is going to do everything. <laughs> And I hope that you will make the effort to come. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying, Barb. It's OK. I'm just reading the news here. Who else? Yes, Lynn. I'm going to stand up so you can hear me. Um, I have a couple of companies at the back, but one of our church members sitting right in the front, Pete Whaley, is going to be putting on his Sinatra show at the Women's oh, Club for our fundraiser for our scholarships this year, like we did the radio show last year. And I will have tickets starting next week, but there's also a number on here you can call. For $20, but it's the Sinatra Show, gorgeous layout of desserts, because it's a 7.30 and I think, and a dance floor. So there'll be dancing. Oh, oh, <laughs> so um, there's one in the back, he's out of you, but see me out, and I'll pull the tickets for him, because I don't know. So anyway, so the date is um, the 17th and 18th of May. So it'll be a Friday and Saturday night. And Pete. I uh, want to tell everybody that Morris and Post is going to the church one too, so let you know. And I'm doing my way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other announcements? Okay. Let's ready ourselves for worship today. <clears throat> so please, wherever you are, make yourself comfortable, supported, relaxed. Attend to your breath just breathing you into this place and this time. Perhaps close your eyes if you like. Scripture tells us that we were formed from clay and dust. God breathed into our nostrils and suddenly we lived. That means the very breath of life is the divine in us. It's good to notice it and give thanks for it. Then slowly open your perception out. This time is about us and the light and our community of worship. We welcome the sacred time as we ring in the hour of worship together.
thunder and the lightning gave voice to the night. A little child cried aloud in her fright. Hush, little baby, a story I will tell of a love that has vanquished the powers of call to worship in your bulletin. It is adapted from 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 13. Gathered in this place, we are the, body of the hands and feet, the heart and lungs, participating in the miraculous body, a body that sings, a body that rests. A body that rejoices in the wonder of serving and loving God together. We are the body of Christ. Gather in this place. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning, everyone. Not sure if you caught the verse, but I just want to reread it because this song was perfect for what we're talking about today. So my pain is pain for you, and in your joy is my joy too. Isn't that fantastic? Um, thanks, Peter. Uh, so my name is Mark, if I haven't had a chance to meet you. And if you look at your bulletin uh, that says Marks of Faith, I promise, Scout's Honor, I had nothing to do with this. I didn't know this is what it said until I arrived this morning, I promise. So uh, um, if you could please uh, join me, follow the uh, unison prayer and let's read that together. Loving God, you called us into being and created us to be in community. We thank you for your church, for our siblings, the family of God. We are mindful that our community of faith extends beyond these walls and borders into the whole world. You continue to call us to live in faithful community with others. Call us away from the ways of this world that separate and dehuman us. Guide us into your, into your ways of love and justice, where we see each other as siblings, where we are called to live in communion with each other. May we continually walk toward building up your kingdom of heaven on earth. We ask this in Jesus' name, and amen. And now for one of my favorite times of the service each week, the, the passing of peace. So, peace be with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. of integration and guidance this morning are by the wonderful Rachel Held Evans. On the highest hill in Bolivia stands the Cristo de la Concordia, the second largest statue of Jesus in the world. At 112 feet tall, the steel and concrete Christ of Peace towers over the city with arms outstretched, tiny windows dotting his hollow body so that tourists can peer out into the world. I must confess, however, that I've always been a, bit, been a bit weirded out by giant renderings of Jesus. The radical rabbi from Nazareth spoke so often of humble obedience and quiet service that pomp and grandeur don't seem like his style. The statue seemed so removed from the people below, looming over a city where her hunger, abuse, poverty, and despair hide in the shadowy corners. Then I suddenly remembered a favorite poem from, from St. Saint Saint Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on his world. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. 
Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks on compassion on the world, Christ has no body now on earth but yours. A statue cannot be Christ in this world because a statue cannot be animated by the Holy Spirit. But people can. His church can. We, his people, and his church can be Christ in the world. The words of the Holy Scripture today are from Luke chapter 17, verses 20 through 21. One day the Pharisees asked Jesus, when will the kingdom of God come? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God can't be detected by visible signs. You won't be able to say, here it is, or it's over there, for the kingdom of God is already among you. The Holy Gospel according to 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 27. Glory to you, O Christ. All right. And your cue. All right. Because <laughs> last time I got it wrong, and this time I was so ready to pause. And then you got it wrong this time. All right. Verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the parts of the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And there you got it. All right. So I don't know uh, how many of you grew up in a church. I did. And uh, I don't know for those of you who grew up in a church, if your church was potentially a little messy from time to time, but mine was. Um, I grew up in New Mexico in a little town called Clovis, way over by the Texas border. And uh, I went to a, a Nazarene church that was about four or 500 people, so it was a pretty big church. And it got messy from time to time. I have a few memories seared into my head of some of those situations that occurred. Quite, quite funny, some of them. We had... Um, we had a janitor, uh, grounds facilitator, did a fantastic work around our, our church. He was full time and he loved to build things. And he had this idea one time for our Easter service that he was gonna build an ascension machine made out of a lawnmower engine for Jesus. At the end of our big Easter service, we would have fog, and lights and strobes and Jesus would ascend into the heavens. And for the first two Easter services, we had three services. For the first two, it worked fine. Although you could hear a bit of a humming, uh, you know, engine and you'd smell a little gas, but Jesus ascended up into the 
up in the clouds, this big, this, this big fun moment. The third and final service, the lights come up, the curtain goes up, Jesus is standing here like this, and he doesn't ascend. And then you can hear John, our janitor, run in the back, and you can hear a lawnmower being pulled, you know, trying to, trying to start the mower. And then all of a sudden, Jesus did ascend, and it happened too quick. It shot him up really quick. And you could hear the entire church kind of grasp that maybe Jesus was going to go through the roof or something. We had a, a family, I obviously won't name their name, but they would arrive late every Sunday, and, and, as is, uh, <laughs> and they had four kids, and they would sit on the second or third pew every Sunday. And we had this church kind of in a round, so you could see pretty much anything going on. And they, I called them the personal grooming family because they would do a lot of their personal grooming on the second pew of church every Sunday. <clears throat> First would come out the eye drops. And they would, mom, dad, and then the four kids would pass down the eye dropper to put in the eye drops. You'd see each of them, you know, bring their head back. Then the fingernail clippers. Now you do the, uh, the fingernail. Then the lotion, you know, they're like patting the lotion, lotioning the hands. Then the nasal spray sometimes, during allergy season, of course. I'll never forget a summer camp I went to, and we had a very charismatic speaker come and speak, and he really riled up. I was in junior high. He riled up all the junior hires, and as can happen at summer camp, for those of you who went to them, and this is not the water slide story summer camp. This is a different one. Uh, people's emotions got a little carried away and he started talking about demons. And I'll never forget, we had altars at the front. He opened it up and a girl, probably seventh or eighth grade, went down to the front and started screaming bloody murder. And uh, he said, well, I think we've got a demon down here. And, uh, and he cast out the demon. I remember thinking, where is this demon? Is this demon in the rafters? Where is this demon? And then as can sometimes happen with junior hires, if one person has a demon, others want a demon, right? You know, junior hires can be a little heavily influenced, and so before you knew it, another person went down, and they had a demon, and then there was another demon, and there was another demon. It got out of control pretty quickly. We had a live nativity every uh, winter, and we would do it outside. It was really cool but it was often freezing cold and in New Mexico, very windy. And so usually the people who came to watch the live nativity were our parents because uh, the junior hires and high schoolers put it on. But one year we had an idea, kind of a debate over it. We're gonna put the angels that appear here during the uh, live nativity scene, and we had a narration, we're gonna put them up on the roof of the church. So we had this wonderful idea that the seven or eight angels would appear the spotlight would come on, the dramatic music, and they'd flap their wings. Well, we did that, but it was about 40 mile an hour winds that night. And one of the demons, or demons, sorry, yeah, sorry. One of the angels, sorry, uh, my cousin, Pam, holds open in this big dramatic moment her wings, and you see her blow off the roof. Literally, just, and you hear the crowd gasp because the wind caught her wings, and this was not the wind beneath my wings, this was a different wind. Thank goodness she fell off onto like the next level. There was a kind of a parking area below and she wasn't injured. Uh, and then we had the great debate that went on pretty much the entire time I was attending the church as a kid, and that was, are we gonna sing, those of you who grew up in churches may have heard this debate before, are we gonna sing choruses that are more modern? Or are we going to sing hymns that are more traditional? Nancy, uh, I know Nancy went to a Nazarene church like I did. I'm sure this debate happened in your church, Nancy. My dad was spearheading this debate because my dad was also the church pianist. And he was very much on the we're going to stick with hymns traditional side. They would debate, fight, people left the church over it. My dad, if a service ever got too out of control with choruses, would just leave. He'd just go home uh, in protest. So I share all this. My church was a little messy. But you know what? I have one memory that will never leave. I have 
an older sister, she passed away a few years ago, but she had something called Rett syndrome, R-E-T-T, -T, which is similar to Down syndrome, but worse, she was mentally and physically retarded and uh, needed full-time care. And so when she was three or four, I was just born, my parents found a full-time care facility four hours away where she would uh, move and live. She couldn't talk, walk, she had to be hand-fed everything, lifted out of her wheelchair. And uh, anytime Sherry was my sister's name, anytime Sherry would come to town to visit us, guess who would show up with food every night? Those people I was just talking about. The chorus, hem debaters, the ascension machine guy, the family that did the eye drops. They would show up with food, they would show up with gifts, and they would make sure whether my sister was staying for a week, or two weeks, or a month at times, that our family was loved and taken care of, and that we knew we were a part of something special. Isn't it true that the church, like the church I grew up in, potentially our church here, can be a little messy, but it's also incredibly marvelous. I think of Lynn, who does that very food organizing that, that people did in my church. She's done it for how many years here, Lynn? Many years. Four. And if you've ever been sick or in need, you know Lynn finds out, and food's on the way. Love's on the way, hope's on the way, caring is on the way. The church can be messy, but the church is also marvelous. And I would say this church, Douglas UCC, is the most marvelous one I've ever been a part of, but we're also messy. Why is this that? Why is the church messy? Well, think about this. We are the ultimate blended family. If you've been a part of a blended family yourself, you know it can be challenging. We're, we take blended family to a whole new level. It's like gathering a bunch of Dutch, Italians, Germans, Spanish, Polish, Greeks, Brits, Southerners, Northerners, rural folks, city folk, liberals, some conservatives, there's a few, um, <laughs> and bringing them together for Thanksgiving. But guess what? And you've been to those awkward Thanksgivings sometimes, right? Where people from different beliefs and backgrounds and histories come together. But this Thanksgiving that we come together at this church, it's a, it's a forever Thanksgiving. It doesn't end in two hours or three hours. It's forever. Of course it's a little bit messy. We're the ultimate mutt of backgrounds. When people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm a bit of a mutt. I grew up in New Mexico, born in Oklahoma, lived in California, Idaho, Illinois, and now Michigan. That's a lot of, that's, I'm a mutt, right? We're mutts, no offense. We've got Catholics, Lutherans, Presbyterians, non-denominational, Assembly of God, Baptists, a couple Nazarenes, Nancy and I, Reformed, Churched, non-churched, raised conservatively, raised liberally, gay, straight, trans, married, widowed, divorced, never married, rich, poor, white collar, blue collar, old, and a little less old. <laughs> I'd been waiting for that one, all right? Because I'll tell you, Jeremy and I realized a few years ago as we were both getting close to 50, we were no spring chicken. But here we're kind of a spring chicken. So why is the church messy? How can that be, body of Christ, but still messy? Isn't it true, if you think about your own life, that in the mess, in the pain, in the hurt, in the challenges that you face, isn't it in those places that you find the deepest love and the deepest grace? Isn't it in those places where you learn the most, where you're challenged to grow, to think maybe differently, to find new friends that you never thought would have been your friend? 
That's the messy and yet marvelous church. You see, Jesus embraced the mess. In fact, if you read, he was often annoyed by those trying to be perfect. And you know he showed love to, exceptional love to, was the sinners, the people who were struggling. I think of the woman at the well, the adulterous woman, people gathered around, hurling insults at her, telling her about her sinful, bad life. And Jesus comes in, and what does he say? You who are without sin cast the first stone. It's in the mess that I think we often find love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, the fruits of the Spirit, Jesus himself. In our messiness, we find that space to come and be loved for who we are. Kathleen said it so eloquently at the beginning of the service. No matter who you love, your background, whatever, you're loved and accepted here. That's a pretty cool family. I want to be a part of that family. We are a part of that family. But it can be messy. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I think in the mess, we find that hope and love even stronger. Some quotes I love, Pope Francis says, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty, because that means it's actually been out on the streets, rather than just sitting in the church, confined and clinging to their own security. The church, another quote, the church should be a hospital for sinners, not a museum for the saints. I love that one. Albert Einstein, not so much about the church, but said this quote, we must learn to tolerate our differences. We must welcome them as the richness and diversity which can lead to true intelligence. True intelligence, this richness and diversity that comes from interacting and being with people who are not like us, who think differently than us, who may think that choruses are better than hymns, or hymns are better than choruses. So why focus on the messy and marvelous church on a Sunday after Easter? Well, if you recall, in the Gospel of Luke, we read that Jesus, after being reappearing after the resurrection, left. He ascended. Went up to heaven. That's what it says in the Bible. And I almost wonder if people were sitting around in that moment who potentially saw that and he leaves. It's almost like, for those of you who are here, December 31st. Remember what happened at the end of the service? Sal and Greg walked out the door. And then they shut, someone shut the door. I don't know who it was, but someone shut the door and we were left sitting here. And I don't know if you had that moment in your head thinking, oh my goodness, they're gone and here we are. What do we do? I wonder if they felt that when Jesus ascended. Oh my goodness, he's gone, we're left, what do we do? And yet, there was a plan. You are the plan. This church is the plan. The body of Christ is the plan. He left us here on this earth, and as Kathleen said earlier in the reading, this is the body of Christ. The kingdom of heaven is you. It's you and I. So what does the Bible say about all this mess called the church, the body of Christ? Well, just a few instructions from the scripture I read earlier. These aren't Markisms, I promise. This is from the scripture. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's giving them instruction. He's giving them coaching, if you will, on being a church. And he writes this beautiful scripture, this, the eye cannot say to the hand, the foot cannot say to the head. I love this. It's one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible. Just a few things from it. Number one. You, every single one of you, are necessary. The foot should not say to the hand, because it's not a part of the hand, I don't need you. We all need every single one of you. If you've ever thought, well, I'm not really a part, they don't need me, we do. And I don't mean we need you to go mow the lawn, although maybe. <laughs> But we need you. You're a part of this church. Two, diversity is a must. And we have some great diversity here. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Three, no superiority. 
The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. There's no superiority. No part is greater than the other. Some parts are more visible, some parts are more up, but no part is greater than the other. Weaker parts, number four, are even more necessary. I love this part. Those parts that seem weaker or unnoticed are even more necessary. You know, I don't know about you this morning, but I didn't get my liver dressed up to come to church. But I did put on my glasses and did my hair. We don't ever talk about the liver, right? But it's important. And that's what Paul is saying. Sometimes there's parts that are less noticed, and yet they are functioning in such a way that they are so necessary and so vital to the health of the body. Parts that seem less honorable are given more honor. God gave honor to the parts that lacked it. No fighting, number six. Disagreements are okay, and we have them in this church. Disagreements are okay, even good and healthy, but each part at the end of the day must honor the other part. For their differences, for their different beliefs, no matter how irritating you may find that other person. Seven, equal care for equal parts. And last but not least, number eight, we rejoice and suffer together, my favorite part. Just as in the hymn that, that uh, Peter chose. Your joy is my joy. Your pain is my pain. That's why we do joys and concerns, because it's a time to celebrate the joys that people are experiencing, and it's also a time to share the burdens for those who have burdens. So what if Paul rewrote this letter instead of to the church at Corinth, to the church at Douglas UCC? I took a stab at it. I'm not Paul, but I took a stab at it. Here's the rewritten part. Now, if Jeff Spangler should say, because I am not Peter Black, playing beautifully on the piano week to week, I do not belong to Douglas UCC, he would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of our church. And if Jeremy Lund were to say, because I do not have a deep, low, amazing reading voice like Tom Falstrom. Where's Tom? <laughs> Tom has the best reading voice. If you heard, I feel like it's James Earl Jones, right? Like it is, it's good. So if Jeremy were to say to Tom, hey, I don't have the good reading low voice that you have. I'm not a part of the church. He would not cease to be a part of Douglas UCC. If all of Douglas UCC were like Greg Sherman, who would be the patient? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Greg is a, a therapist. If we were all therapists, who would be the patient? If their whole church were Larry and Sue, I think you know this, but Larry is a pilot, Sue was a flight, flight attendant. On the plane, if it was just pilots and flight attendants, who would be the passengers, right? <laughs> But in fact, God has placed the parts, and I mean you and me, of Douglas UCC, every single one of us, just as he wanted them to be. If we were all a bunch of video and sound volunteers who do a wonderful job every week, who would they mic? Who would they video? Who would we listen to on sound? If everyone was just like Lynn Snyder delivering all this food, We'd have a lot of food, right? <laughs> the acolyte cannot say everyone must be an acolyte because we'd probably burn the place down. <laughs> Joyce Wright cannot say to Kelly Wright, I don't need the building to be cared for. <laughs> Kelly does a great job caring for the building, right? And Kelly can't say to Joyce, we don't need snacks on Sunday. Please never say that to Joyce. <laughs> The members of DUCC who are homesick, bedridden, or struggling with mobility issues, those are the ones we should give extra honor to. And the members of DUCC who are in need of food, or financial help, or employment, those are the ones upon whom we should shower our generosity. God has brought us all together here at DUCC, the messy, and marvelous church that we're all a part of. We all need each other, every part. We're a hospital for the sick, 
a church full of misfits, misunderstoods, a glorious group of God's children. The body of Christ here in Douglas, Michigan. And last but not least, never ever forget, when one of us is suffering, we should all suffer with them and love on them and care for them. And when one of us rejoices, it's a community victory. It's a community thing that we should all celebrate and rejoice. Now you, Douglas UCC, are the body of Christ. And you, every single person in this room, every single person listening online, every single person who's traveling or gone today, every single person who calls this church their home, you are a part of this body of Christ. And we need you. Every part, no matter what part you play. My prayer for us today is that today and in the future, we can embrace the messiness just a little bit more and recognize it's part of who we are. And may God help us to become even more marvelous than we are today. I have absolutely no doubt he will. Namaste. Now is the time in our service where we have an opportunity to give back a portion of what has been given to us. Our ushers will come forward in just a minute. For those of you listening online, there's multiple ways that you can give online as well. Now we're going to enjoy a lovely offering and offertory. I'm Jim DeVries, and for 40 years I had the opportunity to work as a cha chaplain in hospitals. And uh, I've often asked people, like I'm going to ask you later, what shall we pray for? And a variety of different requests. One might be is, would you please pray that my granddaughter can make it home for Christmas? And we'd hold hands and pray together. Or one time I asked, and they says, Will you please gather that this woman can rise again from the dead and join her two daughters at home? And we prayed for that. We don't always get what we ask for or pray for, and you know that here. But believe me, always something good does happen when we pray. We may not see it right away. We may not recognize it. But somehow things get shifted from where they were to a different place. And I have been witness to that in a variety of different ways. People say that I never would have made it if somebody wasn't praying for me. Or what a difference it made that the people that love me have been praying for me or thinking about me. And it gave me that little extra to face the difficulty I had to face. So when you say to somebody, I'll keep you in my thoughts and prayers, first of all, do that. <laughs> but secondly, recognize that even if they don't notice it right away, it will make a difference. So what shall we celebrate today? Or what shall we offer in prayer today? 
And in the meantime, we'll also light a candle for each one of those requests. Any particular one at all? Yes. Right. Again, it's been highlighted, and we do this every Sunday, to remember those in Ukraine. And you think, wow, we do that every Sunday. Does it really make any difference? Maybe people are still dying. But you don't know about the person that maybe is in Ukraine that is dealing with what's going on there that gives a sense of strength because of what we are thinking of them and praying for them today. And so for those in Ukraine and throughout the whole world, for those that face suffering and struggles and war and separation, oh God, Yes. Well, I have a joy to share. Goes along with the theme of today. Um, in recent times, uh, through Ancestry.com, we discovered a family member that no one knew of at all. And uh, this boy this week celebrated his 31st birthday, and my family gathered for a birthday party for him. He, in return, sent a note to the family saying, I, I'm so touched that I have found a real family. He said, this is the first time I've ever had a birthday party. Mm -hmm. And he says, I feel so loved. And uh, it's been just, it was messy in the beginning when we first found out. It was like, who did it? How did this happen? <laughs> but this boy has just been blessed. And we're so thrilled that we're blessing him. For all those that get reunited, for whatever separation or pain they experience, when they find the love of family or friends, like the one you have expressed for this 31-year-old that finally had a birthday, uh, thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Others? Oh, yes. <laughs> surgery and he's in a lot of pain and I ask prayers for Scott and I also have a friend who uh, did also had neck surgery her name is Cindy and those two people who are very dear to me I ask prayers for this for, for healing okay for Scott and Cindy, who are facing a variety of back and uh, neck issues, facing surgery, for all those that have health issues, those that uh, wrestle with uh, pain maybe every single day, for all of them, we pray for their healing and for their comfort. Oh God, hear our prayers. My sister Janet called me yesterday morning and said, I have some bad news. Are you able to take it? And I said, yes. And she said, I spent eight hours yesterday at the doctor checking up on suspicious looking symptoms. Mm -hmm. And they think I have four stage lung cancer. Oh, no. And I don't know how long I have. I'll get the results of those MRIs <coughs> and other tests sometime over the next couple of weeks. She lives in South Hadley, Massachusetts, which is where Mount Holyoke is. She's not associated with Mount Holyoke, but that might help you place it in Southwest Massachusetts. I'm going to be leaving probably in a week or two and spend some time there with her. I'm the oldest brother. She's the younger sister of mm -hmm. four of us. I think I can be helpful, but I, I want to be there. She needs support, and I'm happy to provide her. Okay. So her name is Janet. Anything you can say in Janet's behalf? I would appreciate for the reasons that we were told earlier today. Thank you. So we pray for Janet, and we pray for all that surround her, and for safe travels as well as you join your sister. And we're mindful of the support of family, whether it's uh, through blood or through fellowship like we have here today. Oh, God. I'll be undergoing surgery on Tuesday to remove a kidney stone. Uh, it's not uh, a serious thing, it's, pretty, it's an outpatient thing, so I should be back on my feet in no time. And I appreciate your prayers on that one. And also for my friend, Bill Hess, he uh, went to uh, or, or Meyer Heart Center for a ablation uh, operation, which was six hours long, 
there are very serious complications afterwards, and he's still in intensive care. <laughs> and so for Jeff and all those that face uh, surgery, or those that are still facing a doctor's appointment coming up, uh, may God protect you and surround you and send those individuals that can restore you back to health. Oh God, I celebrate uh, with those that have worked so hard to find our interim pastor and so for uh, Pastor Jody who will be joining us, I guess is already a part, but soon will be leading us in worship. For all those that made that happen, those behind the scenes, all the effort that they have made, uh, we look forward to her arrival as well. Oh God, and mindful of those that are joining with us on YouTube, uh, the concerns or joys that you may have, you're such an important part of our congregation, so we're mindful, and so, oh God, we light one final candle for those things that we carry within our heart. Maybe those joys we thought too insignificant to share, or maybe those things that are just too painful to mention, but for them as well, oh God. And now please join me in singing. So we, we, uh, we ring this uh, Tibetan prayer bell every Sunday. And it's, uh, it's a reminder that there are people uh, praying in different languages, different traditions, different experiences. Uh, this probably never came as true, true for me as I got called to an intensive care room to send this individual on his final farewell. And as I always did, I gathered with a group of family around his bedside and I said, any particular tradition or religion I should be sensitive to? And he said, uh, we're pagan. It's okay. I said, uh, any of you Wiccan? She said, oh, the one of them said, yeah, I'm Wiccan as well. And another one says, I'm followers of Jesus. And so we gathered together, held hands, and sent this guy forth. So truly, it's not the name that we use in our prayers or how we understand it, but there is something greater than ourself that we can reach out to and hold on to and that can bring us a sense of hope each and every day. And so as I ring this bell, may that bring you hope and peace as well. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God.
On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took wine and he poured it and he said, this is my blood spilled out for you. It is good to participate in this communion with God and together as a church, as a one body. So we've been talking about today. Let us sing. UCC, we say all are welcome to come and participate in communion. And I'm going to ask our friends uh, worshiping with us in the fellowship hall to come first. Shall remain a single grain, but if 
it dies, it will come to life. We are the body of Christ, broken and poured out, promise of life from death. We are the body and see the goodness, the wonders of the risen one. Come bless our God in all things. Let praise be your song. We are the body of Christ. Please stand with me. So I'm going to ask us to do something slightly different today. We'll do the Lord's Prayer. But I'm just going to ask you, and I watch every week, because I normally sit over here, uh, Larry and Sue try to get everyone to do this. And that is I'm going to ask you to reach out and grab the hand of the person next to you. And maybe even bridge the divide here in the middle. All right. You can see from here how incredibly beautiful this is. Our Mother, Father, always and everywhere, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the mind is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
and live fully and love wastefully and be all that God has called us to be. Amen.